Today's video is boots on the ground interview of the SAR team in North Carolina that I was following, which would include an interview of Lewis, Mindy, Juni, and Jonathan. Now, unbeknownst to them, I requested that this interview take place right in the middle of a location called Irwin, Tennessee, as you guys can see on this map here. Now, there's two primary reasons why I asked them to do an interview here. And real quick, let me zoom in on the map so you guys see exactly where we're doing this interview. This is off the Highway 26. And we did the interview right in the middle, right here, around right here where I'm circling. There are two primary reasons why I wanted to do the last interview at this location. The first reason is, is because the absolute magnitude and velocity of the water in this valley is unfathomable. When I reached this location and realized it was in Tennessee, I immediately asked myself, why is no one talking about this location. In other words, I was absolutely speechless because of the destruction and because of the response. The second reason I chose to go here is because I believe that there is a potential national public emergency going on right now. It appears that there is a massive mulch farm operation, and I would question whether or not FEMA is involved. Now, what you guys are seeing on your screen is an article that came out on the 19th that's stating FEMA program repurposing Helene downed WNC trees into firewood, furniture, mulch, and more. So I think it's gonna be important to ask questions like, are these construction workers aware of the possibility of toxic waste and hazmat material being in the air and in dust? And then I'd also like to ask the question, have these debris piles been searched thoroughly and repeatedly by cadaver dogs or are you just going straight to the mulch? Before I show you the video where I'm driving around this location and we start asking these questions, let me first show you what happened in Irwin. So what you guys see here is Irwin. This is a massive, you know, I don't know how wide this river is, this body of water. It's gotta be 30, 40 feet high. Some people have told me it's a quarter mile long and it completely annihilated this entire area. And again, this is where we're doing the interview. We're doing the interview in the middle, but look at all of the workers on top of that building. There has been multiple rumors stating that there are way more loss of life just as a result of that factory that you guys just saw. But look at the sheer amount of water that literally destroyed you guys absolutely destroyed this area. So there is no question at the sheer amount of danger and damage done to that area. Now I'm gonna play you guys a couple videos of what we saw when we drove around the area, and then I'm gonna pause that, and then we're gonna ask a couple questions that I think are very important to answer. You're about to see that dust pile right there. I'm wondering what type of contaminants are in there. Take a look at this water, this pond. I don't know, it looks radioactive to me. It's probably not, but I'm pretty sure there's some chemicals. Look at the building behind it absolutely destroyed. There's a worker on the left there at the door. You guys are going to see another worker that looks like they're throwing up. I believe, and I'm asking the question, is this area toxic waste dump? So let's keep watching. Take a look at that building right there uh, to the right. Absolutely got destroyed. Here. Now, when I move to the other side of the truck, take a look at what I see. Okay, so we're gonna pause right there for a second. Here is a massive, massive debris pile that they're turning into mulch. They're taking the dust as well and they're loading it to trucks. I don't know where they're taking it. But my first question is, is, is that construction worker on the right, is he just finishing throwing up because of the toxicity in the dust, which you're gonna see when we start the interview with the SAR team? And also take a look at this. Okay, so you see that mulch machine being logs loaded into there? take a look at, I'm going to pause it here in a minute. There is the mulch operation right there. You can see it where I'm circling. So they're turning all of this stuff, a lot of this material into mulch. And again, why would they turn that into mulch when there's potentially chemicals, potentially human remains? Has this area been searched or not? And you guys, when I'm driving by here, understand that those piles right there are 20, 30, 40 feet high. Let's keep playing this. Where's FEMA, guys? Where's FEMA? OK, 
Okay, so where is that truck going? That tractor appears to be taking that dust and those mounds and those piles, putting it into that truck. And my question is, is who's running that operation? And where is it going? If they're turning it into mulch and they're giving it to people to put in their gardens, then obviously they're taking potentially an exposed material and they're spreading it around. And again, did dogs really go through this area? And did they check this area thoroughly? Because if they haven't, wouldn't this be considered a crime? And if there is toxic material, why aren't the employees wearing hazmat suits or respirators? No one is wearing respirators. When we left this location, all of us had dust stuck to the top of our throats. Let's keep watching this. You saw no one with respirators and pay attention to any employee whatsoever and tell me whether or not they look happy or sad and whether or not they look sick. Take a look at this. This is seven weeks later. Where is FEMA? Did you guys know that Tennessee was absolutely destroyed in some areas? If not, here's the proof right here. Now I'm gonna show you guys one more clip. Now when I play this, I want you guys to look ahead as we're doing the U-turn and look how far down the damage really goes. Yeah. Is there a national public emergency happening right now in Irwin, Tennessee? And I want to make very clear that these are my own questions based on what I saw, based on my experience, boots on the ground, and the absolute abomination that was the response of FEMA and any government officials. And I want to also make clear that these are not the SAR team's questions. We're now about to interview the SAR teams, and I want you guys to pay attention to what their needs are. There is a massive need for citizens like them, like these SAR teams, to receive funding from the public because the municipalities, you guys, are not helping them. So listen to this team, and I want you guys, again, to look at the background and look at what's happening behind the scenes. And I hope we can get to the answers of some of these questions. Junie, where are we right now, brother? Right now, we're in Beautiful Irwin, Tennessee. Can you explain to the viewers, you know, how wide you think the wave of water was, which was essentially going from here all the way over to the other side of the highway over there. How long of a distance do you think that is? Oh, I reckon, I reckon the wave of water was maybe uh, up to a quarter mile wide, uh, pushing through this area right here behind us. And this is, um, this is also where the factory was, where, you know, there were several workers that passed away. Do you know anything about that story? Um, I've not heard any firsthand accounts of the workers that tragically passed away here. Um, I've heard second and third hand accounts, but this was a large industrial area behind us. Uh, this is bordering the highway right here, going through Irwin. Um, this is a major hub, man. This is a major uh, hub that was destroyed. Uh, for this town you know Junie I think it's I think you're an extremely credible source of information being that you were essentially here almost day one not quite day one so you experienced the recovery in various stages of the recovery and what I want to ask you again this is just your opinion all right you're a professional but this is not official I'm not a professional <laughs> well no you okay fine you're humble okay you're humble but uh, what I will say is the official death toll for North Carolina, and this is after, you know, we've showed the viewers so much, the official death toll is 102, 102 for the entire state. 
And can you tell me whether or not you agree with that official number? No, Travis, I think that uh, for the state of North Carolina, uh, not even counting Tennessee where we are now, uh, different SAR teams working different spaces um, have identified well over 100. This was catastrophic. This is uh, a mass cash like we've never seen in the United States. You know, and I wanted, you know, I'm, I'm just so sick and tired of all of these people arguing back and forth. And if we want to talk official numbers, let's officially talk about the unofficial numbers. Yeah. I looked at the total undocumented illegal immigration in North Carolina. There's 375,000 undocumented immigrants. Now, if any of them pass away, then it's not going to be counted in the official numbers. Do you do you feel like it's possible that, you know, tragically un undocumented residents here passed away and, and are not officially being counted? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, for many reasons uh, up in this part of the country, uh, not only are we talking about uh, undocumented people uh, that have moved up here, we're talking about people that are on the run from the law, uh, people that are documented as home births that have no record with the state. We have uh, people that want to be left alone and people that are off the grid. So when you tally up those numbers, uh, very quickly you start to get this image that uh, while there are the numbers that the state have put forward of the people that are being looked for, uh, the people that had been identified, there are uh, many, many thousands of souls that have uh, passed away up in these hills that uh, are not being looked for um, and that will never be known. And in addition to the, you know, the illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants, I also looked at the homeless. And just only looking at North Carolina, there was several thousands of homeless, and that was as of 2023. Obviously, it's way more expensive to live right now. Homelessness is skyrocketing. So do you also feel like it's possible that, I mean, man, I've, it just Asheville alone has almost a thousand homeless. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about whether or not you saw any homeless at all since you've been down here? Uh, we have not seen any homeless. Uh, well, I, I would say I haven't been operating much around Asheville. Um, Swan and Ova was really the closest I got to Asheville. Um, the homeless population in this country has already been forgotten. Those homeless that lived, that were encamped uh, along the Swannanoa River uh, in Asheville and, and greater Swannanoa area, um, many of those will never be recovered. And just one more thing, Junie, and I wanna get your opinion here because again, most people, especially if they've been here, they understand what's going on, but there's this whole other you know, group of people that are in complete denial. So when I looked at the records from the FBI on how long it can possibly take to confirm someone's identity through a body part, you know, it could take, again, this is according to the FBI, it can take over a year to get back results. And being that we're not even in week eight of Hurricane Helene recovery, do you think it's possible that, you know, there's thousands of potential victims that have just not gone through the process of determining that they have passed away? Do you think that's possible? Yes, I think that's very possible. Um, I think the government is doing a great disservice as far as uh, the identification process goes. When you pick up, uh, for lack of better terminology, when you pick up a white arm and an African-American arm, can you not immediately say that these are two different individuals here and here? So uh, the fact that it's gonna take months, possibly longer than that to give these people closure, you are withholding life insurance policies, you're withholding deeds to land, you're withholding um, a, a certificate of death, and these people are not gonna be able to uh, continue on. They won't be able to get things signed over. They won't be able to collect that life insurance policy that's um, a small, small band-aid on the wound that's, uh, that those people already have uh, from losing loved ones. And Junie, just one more thing, brother. I just want you to, you know, if we can close on, and, and I have a couple of interviews to go with your team, but can you just say something final for the viewers, just, just one final thing. And I, I just want the viewers to understand, again, you've been here since day one, you've sacrificed a lot. You won't admit it because you're a great person, but just please explain, Junie, what 
is going on out here and what people have to know. They, they, they pull up stuff on, on Google, on North Carolina and say, oh, only 102 people have officially passed away. They don't need help. But that, that's far, far from the truth. Just please, man, from your heart, tell them. The first thing I'd say is just looking at the, the area behind us now. This is an area that supported many families with jobs, uh, with money, with food on the table. That is one small portion. Uh, we're talking about lives. We're talking about people that are made in the image of God. These are not numbers. These are not statistics. Uh, this is not yesterday's news. This is today's suffering for hundreds of thousands of people. We are still here on the ground. We're still working. Um, this is not yesterday's news. This is today's suffering. All right, Jonathan, Jonathan. So um, you are how old? 17 years old. Okay, and you came here to volunteer. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you and I last night were talking, you know, and I'm not going to say, you know, you were uh, on edge. Um, you kind of were a little bit crawling out of your skin and you were like, Travis, get me into the piles. You wanted to search, you wanted to recover. Can you explain, especially to the young adults, you know, what it's like being out here and how helpless you feel? It's just horrible, man. Um, there's people all around and these people don't have closure. Um, they're having to fight just to argue that their family members aren't here. Um, nobody's believing them. Um, nobody can find them. Um, it just feels like really guilty not being able to help and do that. And there's just ways that just you got to try and help. And it's just really guilty knowing that those families need closure and stuff. And I just kind of get to it. And that's why one of the biggest reasons I'm out here is to help in any way, shape or form. But that's one of the biggest reasons I'm, I came out here to help is help families, help with closure. Just because th that's horrible, man. Um, losing your family members and it's, it's not over. Uh, the numbers are a lot lower than they say. It's a lot more than the 102 that they say. Um, and as you can see around, it's not over. Um, this is still going on. It's still a pressing issue. Everybody's backing out and that's when we need help more um, because honeymoon phase is over. No one wants to be here. It's all about just if you have the drive and the fight to stay here and help these families because it truly is heartbreaking. Families are broken up and they're in the worst times of their life and they just need help, man. Can you tell us about your expectations? Like, were you surprised and blown away to, to see this? And if so, in what ways? Um, to say it, I was honestly really surprised to see this because I'm I live down in Florida, um, and only reason I know about this is from my family. I have family that lives up here and stuff. Wouldn't have heard a single thing about it. Didn't see it on the news. Didn't see anything. I knew that a hurricane hit up here, but they don't talk about it enough. Like, it does not cover the level of disaster this is. Once you see this in person, you get up here. It's surreal. Uh, walking around, it's I've never seen anything like it. And I've been in many hurricanes. And it's just nothing had like will beat this ever. Um, it's just a surreal thing. And why, you know, why is it you have such a strong sense of guilt? Uh, just part of me feels that I'm on the fortunate end of all of this because I like to think, what if that was my family just laying in my house and then my family would be broken up? Um, Thank God I was in the fortunate end of that, and I feel it's my my quest as a U.S. citizen to help out these people and be there for the other people in times like this. And it's just a really guilty feeling knowing that they're going through it and I can help them. And again, you know, you're a young adult, you're 17. You know, can you tell me how you feel about the government response and how that response here has potentially changed your impression on how the government really works dude it's it's horrible um it kind of like there's so many sketchy areas around it um like why why are they not helping why where's everybody at you pull up here and it's houses are just gone driving by the river if you look on the maps it's like there was a house there it's, it's just gone it's just riverbank now um there should be more people uh there's there's nobody out here helping besides the, the citizens the citizens are the only people out here helping right now. The government's not helping. FEMA's not helping. None of them are really out here helping but the citizens. And that just shows a lot to go with the government and stuff. Like, where, where's all their government money like going? Where's our tax money going? And it's just, it, it doesn't show. 
And another thing, I mean, why do you think it takes up to a year, according to the FBI, to even get results back to identify? I mean, wouldn't you think that they would, you know, sound a call for help? And it, I mean, let me ask you this, okay? In my, do you think that this story is being suppressed? Oh, 100%. I think it's trying to be covered up. Um, I don't. I have a lot of different theories about it. I think it could be they're trying to downplay the issue so it doesn't seem that big of an issue for the U.S. Um, to make them look better. Uh, they haven't been helping, so if they made it a big issue right now, they would seem horrible for not helping this whole time. But it's it's a grand issue. Um, truly, you, you never see anything like it. And once you're here, it's just you get a deep pit in your stomach just going around and seeing all this different stuff. And it's just, it's heartbreaking, dude. How long have you been out here? I have been out here for 11 days now. I went and helped down in Tampa first, helped out the people that get touched down there because I, I didn't know anything about this. Uh, I knew that Tampa got hit and that's all you really heard on the news, social media and stuff. This is this wasn't covered at all. Um, and that's that's the weirdest part to me is how is a disaster, arguably one of the biggest disasters in U.S. history. Why is it not covered? Um, there is no coverage out here. Travis is thank God he's out here bringing light to the entire situation. And I thank you for that. Um, it's just not covered. It's not talked about enough. There's not enough people out here helping. I would love to see more people out here helping every way, shape or form. We need medical people. It's it's not here. The state's pulling their, their, their medical people out because they say it's over. It's not. People still need help. People are still sick. People are still getting infected. It's still a horrible situation we're in. Mindy, Mindy, you have taken me in. You have given me shelter. Um, if you can, why don't you explain to the viewers where we're at as far as the exact supplies that we need. You are helping the SAR teams, the SAR team boss, stay organized. Uh, you're helping him ask for specific resources, which is where we're at. Can you explain what type of, what are the most important resources right now to get out here? top of the list right this moment for SAR teams and medical teams are enclosed four by fours, enclosed side by side four by fours. I don't know the specific terminology if I'm messing it up, but y'all get it, right? If they're four passenger, um, four wheel drive models and they're enclosed and we can put the description and the link in the comments or in the description, but um, that is at the top of the list because it is cold and it's supposed to snow in two days here. and. I'm gonna let this truck go by. They need to be protected from point A to point B, and they need a place to retreat to in the middle of what they're doing. And so those enclosed four by fours make all the difference for everybody. The other thing, the other reason we need is we're gonna get ready to put um, medical teams in place because the vast majority of medical support has been shut down around here. And we're gonna have people going out to all the remote areas that have been hit really hard so that people can be checked on, elderly can be checked on, special needs people can be checked on at their homes because they can't get out. It's not reasonable. Do you know what happened here exactly? Where we're at right happened now? Happened right here. Um, you know what? I don't know exactly what happened here, but it's pretty clear what happened here. How, how big, do you, you know, how much water do you think <laughs> came My through here. boggling amounts of water came through here. I mean, I used to build these actually. This is the kind of building that I used to do. And um, the amount of water that it obviously took to do this kind of damage is, it, it boggles your mind. It, it You can't even conceive it. I'm, I can guarantee you that the people that were here during this time thought that the world was absolutely coming to an end. So other than the, you know, the, the, the enclosed four wheelers, what is another really important resource that is like scarce right now for SAR teams? Well, I have, I put out a post about dogs yesterday and I am now dog rich. I am canine cadaver dog rich, which is awesome. Um, we have a whole list of gear and I will share a link to that with you, Travis, so you can add it to the description and we can send it to my house um, the other thing that we, you know, money, I mean, they keep asking for things and, and like this morning I'm ordering battery packs and, and a variety of things, but you know, I'm housing them, I'm feeding them, I'm, I'm supporting them in all, you know, all kinds of gear, gas, all the things, right? So, so things are awesome but then I have to figure out where to put them. So if, if we could have dollars 
so that we could buy things as needed, that would be tremendous. And can you tell the viewers how, how has the community helped so far um, for, for your operations? Oh my gosh, people are showing up in droves to help. Um, an entire team of senior citizens got it done with with some muscles like yours, Travis. Yeah, I'm still hurting from <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I bet you but... are still hurting from it. You are a monster in there. Um, cleaning out the shop, making room. We're going to do the barn today. Um, people have shown up with beds. People have shown up with sheets. People are, you know, um, rotating out meals. I need a couple house moms to be willing to come maybe every other day and put things back together because God, I love them, but there I've got a bunch of men everywhere. So um, a couple house moms would be awesome. It, the, the outpouring from the community has been tremendous and, and, and I'm doing this, right? I'm, I'm helping with the SAR teams and they are tremendously important. But the other thing I wanna talk to y'all about is the SAR teams are not the only thing I'm doing and are clearly not the only need in this community. This, I'm also finding very scarce baby formulas. Um, the other thing I'm doing is helping, helping gather building supplies. The other thing I'm helping with is putting mental health pieces into place for folks. The other thing I'm helping with is, oh, is finding other housing for other people that have lost their homes or are coming in to volunteer and you know i'm just i'm coordinating so many different things and going in deep and hard on supporting the SAR teams can you tell you know let's end on say what you think is the most important thing for people that are outside of this area to know right now about the recovery it's not over it's so not over it's not even we've we've scratched the surface like we've we've scraped up as many survivors as we can find did i mention it's not over um we've scraped up as many survivors as we can find we're trying to house them we're trying to put them back together as much as we can but there's a belief out there that a help is not needed and then the other really tragic belief is that what can i do i'm just one person right i am standing here as living proof to y'all that you cannot have any idea how to start doing stuff like this and you can do it you can cook meals you can show up you can there's a lot of there's a lot of log cutting that still needs to happen you gotta you gotta you got a 17 year old in your pocket. I don't know where he went, but you got a 17 year old in your pocket. You and them come on over. We'll put them to work in this in this area. And if you don't know where to throw in at, message me, text me with the top of the text message saying, want to volunteer, send me where, you know, I just need some help tracking the text messages. Leave me your name, leave me your number. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you want to do. It doesn't matter who you are. We need you to be involved and there is a place for you. There is a place for you to help. Well, that's Even very well. people that can't come here. We can still, you can still help. Let me know. We'll, we'll get you involved. We need you involved. You have definitely been, you know, <clears throat> you've definitely been supportive and a pillar. And I thank you for everything that you've done, Mindy. Travis, thank you. You have, you have shown up for this community. You keep telling the story. You've brought awareness. You've helped all of us so much. And your viewers have helped all of us so much. And, and standing here, I will say for everybody, Travis, we love you. We see you. And for all of you, I'll hug him as soon as we're done with this for all y'all. Blue is here, who is now. always trying okay. to save people. And bring and, uh, people together. Yeah, and just to give you guys an idea of where we're at, we're at Irwin. This is the plastic yeah, so, factory I mean, that uh, basically I, washed away several I'm, fatalities. I believe yeah, they were ordered to stay working. And I'm going to try to get overlays here so you guys really understand how catastrophic this is. If you guys drive down through this part of Irwin, you will you. be left absolutely yeah. speechless you because we're to, talking about be, like what junie was saying a quarter mile wide but be more quarter mile wide wave that was about yeah. 60 feet high the velocity tore everything apart uh but it, i'm trying to stay out of these guys ways right here lewis is obviously trying to save people so we'll get him here 
Lewis, this is your real life. I mean, you hang up the phone, you're into the next project, just minute after minute after second after second, brother. And I really want the viewers to understand how much it is you do, how well you get along with others, how effective you are. You are an amazing person. But right now, I would like you to talk about the stage of recovery. Mindy already told the viewers what we're in need of. So we don't have to talk about that. I really want you to explain how the recovery right now, how hard it is and in, in why. Yeah, the operational tempo is definitely fast paced. Um, it's, when you're peering in from the outside, most people have no idea. I think we've talked about this before, but they have no idea what's going on. So where we're at right now, we're week seven. Um, the, uh, there are agencies that are doing a lot. For example, DOT, they're moving along at an unbelievable clip, which is great. They're doing infrastructure, but we have to stay ahead of them. Uh, so that we can continue to do what we do. And what do I mean by what we do is that right now, when we switch from search and rescue mode, we now are working on recovery. And what that entails is, is uh, a little bit involved with the concept of simple. We want to try and identify as many remains as possible, so hopefully those remains will be able to be identified so that we can start adding to the official missing list and, and beyond because there, I don't believe that there is a list of, of people who are not residents where they're coming from communities where we can confirm, where the authorities can confirm that, you know, one person from this community, two people from that community are missing. Um, so what we're doing now is we're, we're accomplishing that. How we accomplish that is we have nationally certified cadaver dogs. These dogs are highly trained. They will only lock on human remains. They will not lock on anything else. Other mammals, it, it doesn't phase them. They're specifically trained dogs. They're hard to come by. Uh, it is expensive to get those, those dogs on station here so they can be deployed with teams. And um, so we have to get that in place. Uh, we're working on that now. We have some that are out in the field doing that. Um, and then we also have technologies with a flight operation for hel helicopters and drones, and they use a technology that allows allow us to peer into debris piles and into the earth and look for heat signatures and various type of technologies that allow us to identify possible remains. Once we're able to, to have two dog hits and uh, a third uh, through technology identifying a spot, then we can get uh, we bring the sheriff's office in, we bring in the coroner's office, and then usually we can get the coroner's office to, to allow us to get a permit. And then from that point, it's, everything's turned over through them through a, a very uh, detailed chain of custody uh, process. And then um, we either walk away or they ask us to assist in excavating that those remains. Um, once we have identified areas all along the riverfronts throughout the region from uh, east of Chimney Rock all the way up into past Irwin, Tennessee, once we have identified those areas that need to be searched with various hits that we make, and those areas are marked in blocks of red, once we clear that whole section, it could be a few miles, it could be 11 or 12 miles, once we clear each one of those blocks, it flips from red to green and then that is sent up to the emergency operations center in, uh, at the state level. And then it just reaffirms that with the DOT and other uh, organiza state organization, federal organizations are involved in, it allows them to clear these areas and they understand that it's clear so they can keep on rolling and they know that things are not being covered up. Uh, we have a good relationship with that through that process. And uh, for right now, uh, that's what we're doing. And it's uh, detailed, it's tedious, long hours. Uh, we have crews that are being pushed uh, to the max. The dog teams are being pushed. That's the reason why we need more because these dogs are finely tuned uh, assets. And if you push them too hard, uh, it could be harmful to the, to the dog. So we, we are really trying to make sure that we can make sure that the dog teams, the dog itself, uh, is, remains healthy and very uh, viable and accurate in their work that they're doing. Um, this doesn't come without a toll though. We have equipment. Toll, that toll is, uh, 
it's putting a lot of hard hours on our personal equipment. And this is personal equipment. This is not equipment that is coming from uh, a, a governmental agency or a company. So for example, my own, and, and I have to tell you, it's, it's very humbling for me to tell someone that my vehicle needs a lot of work. My personal uh, SUV, which I use to haul trailers and everything with me and get me from point A to point B, uh, it needs work. And um, um, I, I need to get a like an F-150, a truck that can handle the workload that we're doing four-wheel drive. Lewis, um, why don't you say, you know, we're gonna end on this interview and we'll get the viewers out of here but what would you like to tell the viewers and also have you noticed that the videos are helping your operation have you had an outpouring of help can we end there brother yeah I, I'm not this kind of out of my area but I can tell you that just a few interviews that I've had um, it has been a tremendous help for this operation people it's opening eyes they're seeing it it's they're just they become energized, and um, there's a bit of frustration that they're dramatized to me when they call and they reach out to me, but their immediate thing is they don't even hesitate. They're like, how can I help you? And they're helping. And so uh, if that tempo can increase, uh, we will be able to see our way through these very difficult winter months that are coming so that we can reassess when the warm weather arrives. What is your concern, and we'll end there, what is your concern though, because into the future now, what is your concern about the winter months? The winter months are gonna be very difficult for people that have lost so much. If their home is gone and they're sleeping in tents or they're in campers, uh, it's gonna be difficult for them to survive. They have to have hygiene, they have to cook, all of that when it's winter and it's snowy and icy, that's tough. If they're in a tent, we want them out of a tent. There's no place for a family to live uh, and, and the other thing is these, a lot of these areas are, it's dangerous because there may be contaminants in the, in the, in the, uh, in the ground and in the wood and everything that they're, they're, that they're trying to survive and live within on their own property. So, so that's the biggest concern is for me, is making sure these people have warmth, they have food uh, and shelter during, the, uh, during this difficult winter period and that they receive the mental health care uh, by trained uh, mental health professionals during this period because it's going to be very difficult for them to keep their spirits up and move through this, especially if they have families. Very difficult. Well, Lewis, I will say, sir, you have been an absolute honor to try to keep up with and to work uh, alongside, brother. And I, I'm going to try to get back out here as soon as possible. Well, thank you for everything you're doing. And I want to thank the American people because it is because of you that this operation and others like it are moving forward. Thank you from the, from the bottom of my heart.